Canada and the United States are aiming to crack down on illegal gun smuggling. Ottawa and Washington signed four new or updated agreements that cover investigations, the sharing of intelligence, illegal firearm tracing, and ghost guns. This is a very dynamic environment. We respond to the dynamic landscape by dynamism in our law enforcement actions. It's all about meeting the moment, meeting the changes that occur, and addressing them uh, uh, in real time sharing actionable, relevant information in real time, and that's what we achieved uh, over the last uh, day and a half. Canada and the U.S. are also aiming to better cooperate on policing drug smuggling. Marco Mendicino is the Minister of Public Safety. Minister, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. So practically, how will the agreements today stop the flow of illegal guns from the United States into Canada? Well, first, we just concluded a cross-border crime forum. This is a forum that Secretary Mayorkas and I reinvigorated in the last year. Um, we had one in Washington last year, this year in Ottawa. It was great to receive him, A.G. Garland, and I co-hosted it with the Minister of Justice, David Lametti. In practical terms, what we did today was we concretized uh, four new or soon-to-be updated memorandum of understanding between the RCMP, Canada Border Services Agencies, and their American counterparts. What does this mean in real terms? It means that we're going to be able to trace more guns and hold those criminals to account. It means we're going to be able to go after more ghost guns, leveraging technology on both sides of the border. And finally, it means we're going to be able to do more joint operations, which will lead to more prosecutions, like we're going to see in Project Moneypenny. Um, this was um, a joint operation that led to the seizure of more than 170 illegal guns. So this is concrete. It's practical. It's part of our three-pillar plan uh, in taking strong action at the borders, introducing strong policies like Bill C-21, and continuing to make strong investments when it comes to stopping gun crime before it starts. So what, what will tangibly be different? I, I mean, how will the police forces and the uh, security forces and border forces interact with each other now in a way they haven't been up until this point? Operationally, um, there will be more streamlining in the sharing of intelligence. Uh, I would also say that there is new and emerging technology that is actually able to identify the origin of ghost guns. Now, ghost guns, for the benefit of your viewers, are, use 3D technology. Um, they're fast. 3D easily, printers, that's 3D right. printers, exactly. It makes it very difficult for law enforcement to detect them. The whole point is to evade the long arm of the law. Uh, by connecting up uh, with our uh, colleagues and our uh, allies across the border, uh, we're going to use some of these new technologies to go after ghost guns. And by the way, I've been hearing about that uh, from law enforcement right across the country. This is directly in response to that. But uh, the streamlining of the sharing of information, was that not happening? happening up until now or not happening at a high enough level? I mean, what changes there? It's happening, and it has been happening for years. But I think it's also true that the magnitude of the challenge around gun crime is also uh, one that is increasing. And so to get ahead of that curve, uh, we've got to look at uh, all kinds of ways in which we can connect up um, operational efforts on both sides. So it's not just about the cross-border crime forum. It's using other um, uh, multilaterals like uh, nulls like uh, the um, uh, the joint task force that we have set up and so just by tracking the milestones around how we share information uh, we can bust up those uh, or organized criminal networks uh, from doing what they want to do which is terrorize our communities with illegal guns so what will be the metric uh, by which you measure whether or not these these arrangements are successful because you know when we, we look at gun crime in the city you represent in Toronto the police are say a lot the vast majority of those guns trace back to the United States right so so how do you know if this is working and how can you quantify the success of these initiatives well I think there's two metrics I would look at um, one is in the last couple of years, we've seen the RCMP dramatically increase their tracing capacity by 250%. So the more guns we can trace, um, the more we can uh, prosecute and hold those criminals to account. When, when you say trace, what do you mean? You trace it back to where it was manufactured, where you it was got bought, it. that sort of thing? Exactly. And how does that help you stop the gun crime? Well, in two ways. One, you can find out where they came from. You can find out which criminals were using them, which, which criminals were trying to traffic them. You can charge them and prosecute them. The second thing is, is that by doing that, you punch up the numbers uh, when it comes to the illegal uh, seizures of guns. And that's something that we've been making, again, tangible progress in 2022, uh, over 1,000, roughly 1,100 illegal firearms seized. This year, you see uh, projects like Project Moneypenny, uh, where you've already got 170 plus guns seized. By tracking those numbers and by being very public about that, um, we can also, I think, send a very powerful message to criminals that if you're in this business, um, you are going to pay the price. So deterrence as much as seizure and as much as investigation. Exactly. So, okay, one of the other issues you talked about with your American counterparts was a crackdown on drug trafficking, namely fentanyl. So 
similar question. How do the agreements signed today deal with that deadly flow of narco narcotics across the border? Well, first, uh, the human toll uh, is, is going up uh, dramatically, and this is something that we've experienced on both sides, uh, you know, thousands and thousands upon uh, Canadian lives that have been either ravaged or lost altogether because of a very potent drug that is uh, something like f 50 times more poisonous uh, than, um, than, than heroin. And so that just goes to show you. I'll tell you, I saw that, uh, that like those lives uh, lost when, when I worked in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we did today was... Um, we uh, agreed that we need to set up a joint task force uh, that will bring all of those agencies together. We talked about ways in which we can share intelligence in the conduits in where precursors are, are coming from, including uh, from, um, from PRC, and making sure that we interdict them, stop that those precursors from getting onto Canadian soil, American soil, which can then lead to the stamping and the right. creation of these pills and then being distributed. You mentioned PRC, the People's Republic of China, and the Attorney General of the U.S., Mary Garland, said today that the government of China, not just operators in China, but the government itself, must take responsibility for its role in the opioid epidemic in North America and stop the unchecked flow of these precursor chemicals for fentanyl out of China. Does the Canadian government share the view that the, Can that the Chinese government needs to do more here? We're, we're completely aligned, yes. And that's what we talked about is joining up uh, our efforts uh, on both sides of the border uh, because this is a, a health crisis. It's a, it's a, it's a type of drug that, that is very cheap to make, easily and fastly distributed by organized crime, uh, and also difficult to detect. So by creating the, the, the multinational platforms that bring together the enforcement agencies, sharing intelligence, mapping it out, understanding how these per precursors are making their way into our countries, uh, we can stop that the, those casualties from occurring in the first instance. So what level of responsibility do you think both countries that the Chinese government bears on the opioid epidemic that's in North America right now? How much responsibility does the government of China bear for that? Well, first, um, we're going to continue to um, do whatever it is that's possible uh, to stop precursors from coming in, including uh, holding uh, the PRC accountable. Um, but in addition to that, locally, uh, we have to make sure that we put the tools in place uh, to proc prosecute organized uh, criminal networks that seek to traffic in this regard. So that means making investments as our government has made when it comes to combating against guns and gangs. And we're going to have more to say about that in short order. It also means making sure that we work very, very closely uh, with the United States, with Mexico as, as well. We talked about uh, dealing with this issue when we were at the North American mm -hmm. Leaders Summit. And by taking a continental approach, uh, we think we can make uh, the kind of significant progress that is necessary to reduce the tra tragedies that have been caused by opioids. But if Mary Garland says the government of China needs to play a role in this and you say you're aligned, I just wonder what level of responsibility do you think the government of China bears for all of this? Well, I think they first have to acknowledge that the precursors are coming from their country and then um, being used to create opioids. And so by amplifying uh, that message, uh, our expectation is that they will take the steps that are necessary to stop that from occurring. Perhaps that's uh, legislatively, uh, perhaps that's through other ways, but in the, we're not going to wait uh, for them to do that. We're going to take the steps that are necessary on this side uh, of the world, and that means more collaboration, and that's precisely what we reached uh, in, out of the cross-border crime forum. Has the Canadian government raised this directly with China? Has there been any conversation with them on this point yet? Do you know? Uh, I'm confident that our position is clear on that and that the United States position is clear on that and that, most importantly, we are taking the steps that are necessary to increase collaboration increase the sharing of information, a look at how it is that precursors flow, how it is that once precursors are transformed into the actual pills are created, that domestically we're doing what is necessary to give law enforcement the tools that they need uh, to go after uh, this, this particular type of crime. I also want to say that it's not just about law enforcement, David. Um, there's also a need to take a public health approach to this. And that's why the work that my colleague, Minister Bennett, is doing around mental health is so important. And so even as we go after organized criminal networks, it's also important not to stigmatize those individuals who sub suffer from substance issues. And that's part of the work that I'm doing in partnership uh, with Minister Bennett and equally through my portfolio under the Building Safer Communities Fund. Uh, we just did an announcement about a week and a half ago in Surrey, giving more capacity to organize uh, to uh, local uh, organizations so that we can help people with these issues uh, and stop uh, tragedy and crime from occurring in the first instance. Okay. Minister Marco Medicino, thanks for your time. Thank you.